All right, welcome to the final Night Hacking interview at the JFocus conference. I'm joined here with, I'm going to butcher your name, Attila Sev Svegedi. That's pretty close. Yeah. OK, we'll leave it at that. Yeah. No, it's actually pretty good. And we're going to talk about NASHORN and JVM performance um, in more detail than you guys want to know about. Oh, so definitely. The, the, goal, the goal here is to make sure that it goes over my head entirely, but that it's a lot of fun. And later on, I'll actually figure out what we were talking about. <laughs> All right. I'll, I'll try to shoot high. Shoot high. Shoot high with the technical details. OK, so we were just chatting about, so for those of you who don't know, Attila basically does all of the work on NASHORN, which is the JavaScript compiler that came out in Java 8 as one of the major features. Right. And it's a high-performance um, JavaScript compiler, which allows you to do really cool stuff with JavaScript as a VM language on the Java virtual machine. And I think even since the initial release in Java 8, you've continued tweaking and tuning performance. Right, we did uh, actually even more so than, uh, than for the initial release. Uh, uh, of course, it's also incorrect to say that I'm the only one who works on this. Uh, Marcus Lagergren, uh, my colleague, works yeah. at least as much on it as uh, I do. Hannes Wallnöfer is another colleague of ours, an old Rhino committer that we also uh, got on board. Uh, he has a tremendous help. And we have Jim Lasky, we have uh, our colleague Sundar. So it's, it's usually a team of five people that are working on it to various degrees. Uh, I am the one that's mostly working on the compiler these days, but all of us have our fingers in all pieces of this particular pie because the team the team is team is relatively small so we cannot really yeah afford you the all need to only having one person be able to work on different areas the, of the code of, base of the system yeah so when i was I, I caught part of your talk at the vm tech summit um oh and that will be online shortly as well for folks who weren't able to see it in person i'm publishing all the vm tech talks um from monday of this week okay and one of the things i thought was was interesting was the javascript language makes it quite difficult in certain situations to optimize performance. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah absolutely. Uh, uh, JavaScript is the, the ultimate dynamic language. It issues all static structure as such. So who needs classes? Who needs type declarations? It doesn't have any of those. Because of that, it's, 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 it's pretty weird, because uh, there is no single valid way to optimize JavaScript programs. You, Pretty much any optimization strategy is valid for one program or the other. Um, <laughs> I, I think that if you if you learn how to optimize JavaScript, you can optimize anything. It's uh, it's one so of those. It's, it's the worst case language optimization. It's the worst scenario. case language optimization. It's also hopefully pretty good job security going forward because yeah, okay. it's uh, one of those. I, c I can probably I could probably be optimizing uh, writing and optimizing JavaScript compiler until I retire and still not be done. So, <laughs> um, so, so like, I think when I was watching, one of the examples you had was um, you had a variable which you were storing potentially at one point it was an int, and another point it was a double. Yeah. And because you weren't sure what type it was, mm -hmm. you actually allocated both um, variables under the covers in the JVM. So you actually had an int and a double both specified for the same variable. Yes. And you were storing into both registers yeah, in the bytecode. That's right. So uh, basically, we have a situation where sometimes in a, in, a, in a local range, the variable will be an int, but later on, it might be reassigned as a double. And you might be in a hairy situation where you actually arrive at a control flow point uh, that could have been arrived with either an int or a double. So at that point, you need to promote to double as the, as the narrowest point. You need to go through all of these hoops, because otherwise, I mean, we are emitting bytecode. And uh, you need to have definite types for bytecode local variable slots. Otherwise, the verifier will punish you. It will, yeah. <laughs> the verifier is still in play. The bytecode verifier, it will reject your code if you, if you, if you don't have statically provable types. But still, it is useful if you have a local int range to, to use that local int value in that range. So indeed, in 
best of the cases, we can, we can just keep the int value and promote at the end of the range. There is one particularly nasty case where you have different, I did. <laughs> uh, we have one particularly nasty case where, where you cannot statically prove when you will transfer control, and that's a try-catch block. Uh. So when you are, you, 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 can, you can escape from a try-catch block at any time. So in JavaScript, it's even worse, because in Java, it's easy, right? You can, you can get an exception if you call a function, or you divide, and it might be a zero. And that's pretty much it. In, uh, in JavaScript, a property getter can have side effects. So you can have an exception thrown there as well. So it's pretty much your, your try block, everything in your try block is like one big fat control flow error into uh, <laughs> uh, control flow arrow into your, into your catch block. And you need to you reconcile the types there as well. So that's just one of the small funs with, with trying to translate JavaScript program into, into a statically, statically typed, typed uh, representation that is bytecode, yeah. So. Yeah, and I guess in certain situations you can you can somewhat prove that you're never going to need the double and get rid of it, but sometimes you do. Not in a try catch block, but though. try catch, no. Yeah. <laughs> Otherwise, we are able to do it. Uh, so, asking what exactly did we improve in Nashorn in the past uh, past year or so? Um, we. We released Nashorn originally with Java, with the initial Java 8 release, yeah. and <clears throat> ATU 40 is just around the corner now, and we are very proud to actually ship all of the performance improvements that we've been working on for, well, more than a year. Wow! And so those are all gonna gonna hit in ATU 40. Yes, although some are actually disabled by default, you need to use a flag to enable them, but uh, some of them are, are enabled by default. One of the things that is enabled by default is a pretty extensive uh, local variable static type analysis, specifically. So, um, so um, even number crunching algorithms like uh, various uh, various uh, crypto benchmarks that uh, that come with the Octane uh, benchmark suite that that Google develops, we are pretty much uh, as fast as they are. Uh, if if cool. you look at the if you look at the bytecode that we emit for for the crypto benchmark and other number crunching benchmarks, it looks pretty much as if you actually compiled an equivalent Java program that just operates on ints. So, um, because even in JavaScript, even if you don't declare types, you know that bitwise, bitwise operations will always result in a 32-bit int. Um, a multiplication cannot be worse than a double. And that's crazy when actually not being worse than a double is an optimal case, but it is an <laughs> optimal case because sometimes uh, your value is an object and you need, to, uh, you, you need to have some kind of a number conversion first, but even, but even that is good. So um, uh, we do have that. Uh, so local variable static type analysis is in there. It also had a bunch of very funny corner cases. I think I spent about three, three months from last year, January to March, just being hunkered down and uh, yeah, the static so trying to optimize analyzer. different corner cases. So you, once you get through the general cases, you try different benchmarks or pieces of code, and you find all these cases where your optimizations aren't valid, Pro but you can... Right. Well, probably we don't even have all the cases, but, uh, but uh, we do start uh, from the commonsensical one. We do optimize for... Uh, we, do, we do drive ourselves with the... Also with the Octane benchmarks, because they are the ones that are used, used in the industry. They are basically the... the Yardstick for, for JavaScript, JavaScript performance, performance. Today. and uh, so 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 that's one w one big thing that you don't even see is just that when we are running your JavaScript program, Nashorn always compiles to bytecode. We don't have an interpreter, so uh, in ATU40, the compiled bytecode will be of much better quality type-wise. Hmm. Um, an interesting side effect of that was also pretty good dead code elimination and so on. But the, the, these are minor things. Uh, but but the, uh, this one thing alone allowed for quite a lot of improvements. We did uh, do a lot of array specializations as well. These are also on by default. So if you start with an array and you're just putting in, ints in it, it will be backed It'll with, a, a with an actual array. int array. Yeah. And uh, reads and writes to it will be, will be optimized to go basically to an array field getter uh, operation. 
And of course, there is all the de-optimization that needs to happen if you have your very nice all int arrays and, you and then you pollute it with dropping <laughs> an object in it. So then, uh, then unfortunately, then you, you lose all the inflated. optimizations. Yes, and then you need to to bail out to an to an object array, and you need to box all the ints that were in there. So it's <laughs> it's, it's 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 ugly. It's uh, and you it, don't know that until you actually hit the side case where it, it adds something in awkwardly. Yeah, to the array. some benchmarks actually do this. Uh, they they do things where they have an int array and then they use an object value as a tombstone in it. So the algorithm runs perfectly fast until it reaches to the point where it needs to write the tombstone for the first <laughs> time, and then it's downhill from there on. Nice. And uh, we have uh, we have a lot of other like minor optimizations, as in JavaScript has this thing where where functions are first class objects and you can. And, they, and they, they themselves have operations on them, like call and apply. So you have function apply. We usually, uh, and th there is a spe special pattern in JavaScript where they are doing uh, traditional class-based uh, systems. They emulate them with the prototypes. And one typical pattern that you have there is constructors do crazy things like take a, take a function, apply to the current this and the arguments. We also optimize for that case. However, the, the absolutely biggest uh, optimization and the biggest technological innovation that we have in Nashorn is uh, optimistic typing, which is, uh, which is uh, actually it sounds really nice. We call it optimistic typing. In reality, if, uh, what it is, it is actual, it, the better name for it would be gradual de-optimization, but it doesn't sound that nice. So, so optimistic typing is, uh, is, is what we call it. It, it. it starts like this. In JavaScript, any, you, you read an element from an array, or so you say a square bracket i, or you take an object, uh, take a property from, from an object, so you say obj dot foo. Statically, you have no idea what's the type of the value that you are getting back. So, a uh, pessimistic JavaScript runtime will say, well, you know, let's presume that the return value is an object because that's the worst case that can be, yeah. and then emit the rest of the code with that assumption. But of course, if it's a number, then you will need to unbox it, you will need to check for whether it's a number, the arithmetic operations will suffer, and so on and so on. So, so you're, you're optimizing for the least performing case. Yeah, so basically what we say is that, hey, we have no idea what's the type of the value that we're getting back, but let's assume the best. Let's presume it will be an int. What can possibly go wrong? <laughs> so we emit all the code with the assumption that all the statically unproven variable, uh, values will be ints. And this is where actually the static analysis comes in because it's also important. So static analysis will help you prove as many of the types as you can. And then what's left are statically unprovable types. And for those we say, well, wouldn't it be nice if they're all ints? So we start with that. <laughs> and of course, the code shapes are wrong, so it's a, it's, it's a classical case of, uh, of a round peg and a square hole, is that if you retrieve a property and it happens to be a, a floating point number, or even worse, an object, and you have a method that returns an int, and you expect that you will get an int on the stack, and you have the bytecode for operating on an int, Obviously, there's no way to fit a double in there, yeah. except, of course, if you rounded it, but uh, that, no. that obviously would cause incorrect operation. I mean, even, even JavaScript programmers wouldn't, wouldn't go with that, sorry. Sorry, JavaScript programmers, didn't mean it. <laughs> Please continue <laughs> using Nashorn. Uh, so anyway, uh, what we do in that case is, well, obviously, you cannot continue running that code. So those getters are written in a smart way. At that point, what we do is we need to actually recompile a new version of the code that will, On the that, will, that will be widened at that particular point, saying, well, we got a double here. So we actually need to emit code that operates as if it's on a double. Wow. So the mechanics of this is that we throw an exception there because we cannot continue executing. and we jump out of the function. We do, however, have a catch block that collects all the local variable state, packs it into an array, throws all of this out of the method. And all the callers of that method in their call site are compiled so that they, they are linked, so that they are linked with a 
combined method handle, we are talking invoke dynamic here, that actually has a try-catch combinator. It catches this exception, reroutes back into the compiler, compiles a widened version of the method at that point, wow. then compiles another version of the method, which actually contains the continuation, because this is an optimization. For, so from point of view yeah, of the execution. Yeah, so you need to start from the same point and inject yeah. your local state. It has to be transparent, right? Yeah. We cannot redo any of the computation. Yeah. And then it sort of does, uh, well, an equivalent, an almost tail call into the continuation. And of course, this can cascade because then either the continuation or another invocation of the function Could might actually run further. into another point of the code that, still, that also needs to widen. Maybe you're reading a bunch, <laughs> of, uh, a bunch of properties and they all end up being floating points. Yeah. So, you know what happens is that the code, we will just, whenever the shape of the code is such that an int could fit through it, but you get a double, we will widen it, continue execution. Next time it gets stuck, we widen it again. And then eventually it assumes the shape where all the data can flow through it. So okay. we de optimize the code until we until yeah, it so assumes you, that the shape that... that, that uh, if you have a tight inner loop run. or something, then you only pay the performance penalty for the first widening, assuming that subsequent invocations are using the same data types. Subsequent, yes, exactly. And if they don't, then ev even later, it at any get time... Further. So, so it might be that uh, function will function code will stabilize at some particular point, but later on in the execution, you will get an even wider yeah. data somewhere. I mean, it can recompile at any time. There's no, no such cutoff point where it solidifies and you cannot compile it anymore. You can recompile at any time. Uh, also, uh, oh, and we're using another really neat trick. One, one, one really liberating, uh, uh, one really liberating uh, realization with JavaScript is that there is no distinction really between runtime and compile time in JavaScript. Uh, I mean, the language specification does not even contain these expressions, right? <laughs> it just says, here's the source code of the program, execute it. It doesn't care how do you execute it. It's, it's our choice that we are compiling it to an intermediate representation and running that, but the specification itself doesn't prescribe that you need to have separate stages. So what we realized is that even when we derail into the compiler so that we need to recompile the function with widened types, we, we realize that, hey, we can use the runtime data to guide our recompilation. So first time we go into recompilation, uh, we will actually cheat a, well, cheat a little bit. We will peek at the available data. So we will look at the other local variables. We will peek at the properties of the object. So if, the, if you have obj.foo and it's and it triggered the recompilation because it turned out to be a double instead of an int. But you have 10 or 15 or 100 other property evaluations in the program uh -huh. saying obj2.x that the compiler, since at that point we actually pass it the runtime scope with all the variables that are live at that point. And as long as stuff is side effect free, the compiler will actually evaluate those at the recompilation and see whether they also will need to be widened. So, it, so instead of uh, just recompiling that one call site that had to be widened, and then you know continue execution, hit the next one, compile again, continue execution, hit the next one. So instead of re if you need to widen ten call sites, instead of recompiling ten times at the first recompilation, we will try to evaluate everything that's possible side effect free, and then do one compilation and just jump ahead in the sequences of compilation, just do it in a batch. So that's, uh, that's, uh, that, that, that's a pretty powerful optimization. You can do this because you, you have this comp recompile at runtime, so wh why not use all the information Use the runtime available. information to get a more yeah, optimal so recompilation. To, to, to make it more optimally. So basically all these things working together, uh, static type analysis makes sure that you statically run with the narrowest types you possibly can. Yeah. Uh, optimistic typing makes sure that you also don't widen any statically unprovable types more than you should. Arrays, um, arrays being typed and only just gradually widening also makes sure that you will never widen the arrays to wider type that you need. But, j but in order to not get accidentally boxed integers or doubles into your interface, 
you need to have your static type analysis and your optimistic typing ensuring to you that otherwise you didn't do unnecessary widenings and unnecessary boxing. So yeah. there is this, this permeating concern in the, in, the, in the code generator that you're always striving very hard to preserve uh, the narrowest possible type representation for your code in, in order to execute. And it's giving us e extremely good results. I won't lie, warm-up is a problem because we will, we will have to... There's to potentially a lot of recompilation yeah, going on during the widening period. Yeah, there's a lot of before everything starts up. So for this reason, uh, optimistic typing is actually not turned on by default in 840. You okay. need to pass a command line switch dash dash optimistic dash types in order for it to work. So it's it's more suitable for longer running stuff. So if you're yeah, building but if a you're services building or long running a, like a Node.js backend service or something which you knew is going to be processing a lot of data, running for a long time, right. you didn't care about startup time. You'd prefer to be using the smallest possible types based on the optimistic typing. Right. And if you are shooting for a long term performance, then it makes sense to use them. Yeah. Also, we have uh, we actually actually Nashorn now in 840. It actually has it before 8040. We also have a code cache. So uh, you can enable a code cache which, uh, uh, in, in which uh, you can actually save the generated bytecode to the disk. And we also have type info cache where already discovered the optimization decisions can also be stored in cache files on disks. On disk. So when you restart your application, it can just, it, the compiler can, can immediately oh. generate the version of the code nice. that was the further the optimized version of the code on the previous run. For the previous so the, run's data So that set. actually also saves you a lot of warm-up on repeated executions. Yeah. It doesn't save you from the warm-up of the initial execution, though. Uh, our, our next uh, focus right now is, uh, is actually Tuning redu the reducing warm-up warm time. time. So, so the 8U60 and Java 9, uh, the, the current team uh, performance focus is uh, is uh, on 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 re reducing reducing startup and warm up times. Cool. So um, on that point, for like forward looking performance improvements mm -hmm. um, in Nashorn, is there anything that you? Well, like you were chatting about this at the VM Tech Summit, but there's anything you wish the VM could do for you, the JVM could do for you, mm -hmm. or the infrastructure that would make it possible to better optimize JavaScript code running on the JVM. Right. Like, what's your what's your wish list for um, hmm. the virtual machine? I see. That's actually a really good question. Uh, I don't think I have a ready-made wish list in in my head, mostly because uh, what we tend to do is, uh, well, fortunately, you you just changed we the are JVM. <laughs> both us and the and the hotspot compiler team are the, within the same company and. If not the same group, but uh, we have a fairly close manage, like a management tree meets not too far up the chain. Yeah, uh, we have a fairly good collaboration. So, uh, so when you need so something, you just call over the wall. When we need something, we we ask them. Of course, they also have uh, they also have to prioritize. So, it's uh, I'm not saying we immediately get what we would want to, but uh, we can discuss things with them in a reasonable time frame, and uh, they actually love running. Uh, Nashorn benchmarks and seeing what's there. <laughs> they did a lot of things. Uh, they did uh, uh, caching of, uh, of method handle lambda forms. And uh, for this de-optimizing recompilation, we are actually using the try-catch combinator. And try-catch combinator used to be like low on the priority list for running fast. Because you know, you're using the try-catch combinator. You probably don't need it to necessarily be fast. Yeah, but this went normal control flow for JavaScript, yeah. you need so, it to be so, really so, so, optimal. So, so, yeah, right. And so we went back to them and told them, yeah, you know, we really need a catch combinator to be fast, even in the fast path. They say, well, it is fast in the fast path. Uh, yeah, up to eight arguments. Why would you need more than eight arguments? <laughs> well, we don't, but you know, JavaScript programmers apparently write functions with more than eight arguments. So <laughs> <laughs> there you go. So I did actually uh, make sure that it's... Uh, fast in the fast path, even with an arbitrary number and arbitrary types of arguments. They also used to have, you know, well, whatever, we'll just box all the arguments and have one generic path for it. And we said, no, we absolutely cannot tolerate boxing. Thank you. So, <laughs> so, so, so they did that for us. Things are, th things are improving a lot. Uh, there's always 
there are things that uh, are inherent. Uh, when we need to relink a call site, then Hotspot will obviously have to de-optimize, drop back to interpreter, re-optimize again. There's not much you can do about that. I think uh, overall, from the point of view of JVM support, uh, we are in a fairly good shape. Uh, one thing that would really help would be if, uh, if we could have tagged arrays. Uh, we actually did create a prototype of tagged arrays. Uh, um, Rickard, uh, developer at, uh, here in Stockholm, actually made them. It's uh, basically an array where in the same slot, the same element of the array, you can store either a long or, or a pointer. Now, this, oh, is, this okay. is obviously dangerous for obvious reasons, yeah. because, you don't, because uh, for security reasons, you, you should not be allowed to, to write a long and then read it as a pointer. Yeah. And the other way around is less dangerous, but still. Yeah. However, under controlled uh, circumstances, we could just use the same slot to store either primitive values or pointers with tagging, because pointers typically have the low, lowest three bits in them are always zeros because they are at least eight aligned. So we could we could be reusing those three bits to tag the type and use the rest as a, as a stag then stag longs. Right now we can't do that. So uh, our object storage, uh, the 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 representation of uh, our objects actually uses a dual representation of having both uh, long fields and object fields. And then we are we are we we are doing a mapping. Uh, uh, NAS one actually. Uh, internally uses uh, generic data classes for its for its JavaScript objects that are just bag of fields, and uh, we also have uh, JavaScript hidden classes that we call property maps. So every object has a property map that tells you what named property or what index property actually maps to which field. So uh, so uh, that 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 way we can we we can avoid having a waste full storage of both object and long if we because we can decide to, to just use one or the other but in some cases uh, unfortunately we have to do both so so tag the race would be would okay. be a nice addition it would cut down on our memory use uh, uh, significantly yeah so it reduce the runtime footprint yeah definitely cool all right so i think this has been a very good tour through all the cool work you'll be doing on NASORN. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, sounds like we all need to get 8U40 and start playing around with it because that's when you really get good performance out of the JavaScript yep. runtime. Um, and it was really cool chatting with you about this stuff. All right, so thank you. Thanks My a pleasure. lot for coming out. Okay. Thanks. And um, this is our final interview for JFocus. So I hope you guys have enjoyed it. Um, the next set of night hacking interviews will be at the Dev Nexus conference, which is in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, Marchish, I forget the dates. So, nice. join us for that, and I hope you guys enjoyed the live stream here from Stockholm. <laughs>